Welcome to the CEN Show, the voice of the world community. I am your host, Rasuki Mascani. Tonight's guest had to postpone. So we're gonna replace that, that, that guest with the Black Community News Forum. And we're gonna have Professor Amin Ra moderate. So good evening, Professor Ra, how are you? Great, 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 great. Excellent. So you can go ahead and take over and we can have a discussion about today's and recent topics that's popular in the news. Yeah. First of all, I want to say Asante Sala uh, Rasiki for uh, the introduction and for uh, allowing me to uh, uh, lead the discussion in uh, this, this, these issues that we are about to discuss this evening. You know, uh, there's so much going on that affect the quality of life and the, and the challenge of us as an African people. And so uh, we, 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 we must look at a number of things. First of all, we want to say a sante to everyone and hope they have, are enjoying what we call Black Music Month. Um, you, you can see it on the televisions and they all make contributes to black music and, and rightfully so. Black music is, uh, is, 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 a, is, is, is an instrument that we made during each era of struggle. Uh, during, they had what they call freedom songs that dealt with uh, the chateau slavery then you had civil rights songs, and then you had um, revolutionary songs, uh, black power songs. And, and at the same time, we uh, invented music, uh, various forms of music in this country. And as Gil Scott said, if the music don't have a message, it should be an instrumental. And what he meant was that, you know, we as a people, um, Although you hip hop right now and um, gangster rap and um, misogynist rap and that seems to sell and it's it's being promoted by generally the, the, the major white corporations uh, by making these individuals that, that play that music uh, um, stars and millionaires and everything we try to teach our children not to do or not to enjoy. Uh, they make millions of dollars doing it. I remember at uh, the record store in Long Beach, uh, Snoop was on top of it during the Crip Walk wearing gang attire. Uh, then at the same time, at, uh, you had uh, Lil Wayne and all of them and they like to mesh that with hip hop, but hip, hip hop is, is, is a little different from gangster rap and gangster uh, misogynism uh, and things of this nature. Uh, Lil, uh, Big Lou, uh, who, who, you know, they just, they just, uh, and too short, all they talked about was pornography and things of that nature. But anyway, getting back to uh, our contribution, the all music, Black music is, a, is, 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 is it comes from our culture. We, are, we have different uh, areas of black music. Like the black music that comes from Jamaica, and then there's Haitian black music, and then there's also um, uh, when we say black African music, uh, and in the various ethnic groups on the continent, they have their cultural music. Uh, Tanzanian music is different from Ghana music because of their environment and their influences and their social system. What came out of the black experience in America was jazz, blues, but the key thing that went with all of the, and rhythm, rhythm and blues, the key element in all of those was soul. And, uh, and that's the that's the instrument that is a spiritual dynamic that that, that we have as a people that uh, inspires us 
to have the rhythm that we have and at the same time uh, create songs based on our condition. When they used to sing uh, Swing Down, uh, Sweet Chariot, you know, those were, those were um, uh, freedom songs and escape and resistance song. Uh, when, they, when they sang Down by the River, you know, Wading in the Water, uh, Bridge Over Troubled Water, all of these songs and lyrics were connected to the time in which we were, uh, uh, what, what time we were in, we were in Chateau Slavery, when all these lyrics came out. And then at the same time, as we went to uh, manumission and, and uh, even before the major civil rights movement, we was always fighting for human civil rights, but the major ones that got notoriety, the big demonstration, you had uh, juke joints and, 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 and we had music for funerals, music for weddings, music for birth, music and dance all went. So music is a very important part of our lives as a people. And, and when, you, when you begin to think about it as, a, as, a, as an influence on our, our understanding of ourselves and our expression to the world, it's very critical. A lot of people don't want to take music serious, but the rest of the world do. I mean, that's, that's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very serious element uh, with regards to influence and speaking to the times in which we were in. I think Julius Nair, one of the African leaders said, you don't sing about revolution. Have the revolution and the songs will come. Uh, meaning the conditions create that. So the conditions created jazz, which was supposed to mean a whole house and horde. That's where jazz originated that. And uh, uh, I think Big Black and Hugh Master Kayla was telling the story about jazz uh, in one of their concerts. And they were saying that, you know, jazz meant, you know, screwing and, you know, you jazz that broad, you jazz this. And so jazz became a, a, a very important part as it, as it developed and artists became more proficient. It became a very important part of our culture. And white folks start playing jazz. They start taking the jazz. See, people, you know, you got white folks trying to sing blues, white folks trying to sing um, uh, not, not only the blues and jazz and uh, rhythm and, 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 and songs that we had, they had the blue eyed soul, the righteous brother. So, all of that was very key. And that's why we celebrate Black History Month because Gamble and Huff in 1978 started what was called the Black. Music Association. And one of their wives named Diane, she pushed organizing. Once they went to Nashville, and she was saying, and they saw all these country music people that had the Country Music Association, they went back and they started Black music. Even though before then, there was Negro Music Association and um, Black Arts Association before that. But Gamble and Huff are credit, accredited with one, starting the Black uh, 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 Music Association. And then second, pushing for Black Music Month, which we celebrate now. Now, Jimmy Carter signed, uh, uh, proposed, had a Black Music Month when he was running, when he was president, but he never signed that legislation. To, um, to make it a hot, a, a note, a, a, a included in the annual cop calendars of activities in America. But it was um, Gamble and Huff and the Black Music Association that pushed Clinton. And then uh, when Obama came at, and, and Clinton signed it and then uh, made it, you know, recognition of Black Music Month. And then uh, when Obama came in, he changed it. He changed the name to African American Music Month, and so that's 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 the critical aspect. But soul is a very important dynamic in everything we do. You know, we got soul food, 
We got soul um, music, as we said. We got soul um, preaching. So all kind of aspects of our soul. At one time, during the 60s, they created a Rhythm and Soul Award at the Grammys. They took it away. Now they start talking about urban music and all that now. See, what we have to understand and, and, and is that we have to develop a sense of, of the white man stole us, he stole our culture, he stole, robbed us of our culture, wouldn't let us practice it, our language, and, uh, and, and even, even the Native American, he wouldn't let them do the ghost dance. He, he, he does that. But we have to maintain it, and our people have to maintain it in the various forms that we can uh, uh, push it. Uh, telling the history of music to our children and the greatest the artists uh, that contributed to our uplifting and spiritual uplifting with their music. We in oppression, but we still dance. We in oppression, but we still marry and, uh, and, 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 and enjoying family. We in, we in a struggle of, of, of lynching and, and all those music took our minds off of it. Uh, to not not necessarily offer of our condition, but gave us an opportunity to express ourselves in a joyous way with each other. And then after the music stopped, of course, we had to go back to our condition. So this is why you have Black History Month, um, Black Music Month. And it's very important that we continue to um, uh, keep it. Uh, I know at African American Studies, most of them have a Black music class and they have black musicology and ethno, ethnomusicology and all of that. So that's very critical. So anyway, I just wanted to throw that out there that this was Black History Month. If anybody have any questions, but I know that brother Ronnie had a couple of issues he wanted to bring up. So uh, Ronnie Roberts. So if any questions about Black History, Black Music Month? Well, um, go ahead, Rigo. I mean, well, I, I, I wanted to, uh, you know, kind of see what people thought about, you know, what are their views on the significance of music and, and how it relates to them. So I think it would be good to hear what everybody has to say, because I have a real, I think I have a real good story, but I, I would like to pass it to the panel to see if they, what what does music do for them and how do they view it? If you don't mind that, Professor Rock. No, go ahead. Okay, let's, let's go ahead, Ronnie. We can start with you. Well, uh, music, music is one of the most important things in my life. Uh, I started. Um, my mom forced me to take piano lessons from first through sixth grade. Hated it with a passion because it took me off to football and basketball field. That's all I wanted to do was play ball, but one of the best things that ever happened to me. I never really learned how to play the piano, but it gave me a jump start into a music career uh, that I began in fourth grade playing drums. I had an advantage over all of the other musicians, particularly the drummers, because all of the drum notes are on the C line. Well, I could read music to bass in the treble club, which gave me a jump start. And I ended up as a result going through high school and start playing trench horn in high school. and. Uh, by the time I was a junior in high school, I became the uh, first African-American male in the state of Oklahoma to make the All-State Orchestra as well as the Oklahoma City Junior Symphony. Um, just because I could play and read music and play the uh, timpani, a xylophone, snare drum, bass drum, bells, just all from those years of playing piano gave me that jump start. At, at any rate, uh, of course, my life has been influenced by and mostly soul music and black music. I was just reading one of my favorite artists that Rigo knows about is Carlos Santana. And I was just looking at a quote that he made today, uh, years ago. I, I, I recorded this in 2016. And what he says is, first of all, the music that people call Latin or Spanish is really African. So black people need to get credit for that. And shout out to Carlos Santana for letting the truth be known. Well, as, as 
anyone who knows anything about Santana knows, he was born in um, Tijuana, Mexico. Has a brother, Jorge, that also played with him and another brother that's a touring musician. But he grew up and he his musical journey was through most of the great jazz and a lot of rock musicians, Miles Davis, John Coltrane. Those are his heroes. Those are his stars. Those are the people to him who played the purest form of music, which is called American. Jazz music is truly American music. It's what we would really call American classical music. There's just nothing like the improvisation of jazz musicians, period. Uh, the old jazz guys with Miles and the guys back in the B-pop days, Bird, Dizzy, Monk, Bud Powell, all of those guys, they were truly, truly giants. Those, those are truly guys who should have just been wealthy beyond their years, but they had to go to Europe to get recognition, make money, and be treated like the kings that they were. Well, segueing back into the United States, most of them made the trip overseas to Europe, particularly Paris and London, Germany, Japan. They were just really treated just like different human beings. Um, when they come back and bring that to the States, finally, the uh, Caucasians started seeing that there was a commercial market for these giants. And they were better off in clubs beside the, the little clubs and speakeasies that they had in Harlem and that they had in, in New York City. And they started doing things like bringing Billie Holiday and Ella Fitzgerald to the uh, New York Philharmonic and to the Kennedy Center, what it was before that. But bringing these great artists to light and started trying to literally white these great artists like Ella Fitzgerald and Billie Holiday and clean up their image so they could produce, so they could deliver them to white America in a, in a white fashion, clean them up, make them comfortable for white folks to look at and take advantage of their great and obvious superior talent as musicians, singers, producers, dancers, choreographers, uh, hoofers, the whole nine yards. We just excel in that kind of stuff. The only music that's native to America, American classical music, and rock came straight from our blues, as Lil Richard and, and, and guys like that. The only music that's really truly American music, American classical music is jazz. Now, uh, segueing further into that, one of the reasons Rigo and I hit it off other than we were mad teachers from Mastani, early on was our love for reggae music, another black music, another African music. I love for reggae music, which is to this day, we talk reggae. We talk about many, many things when we talk, issues of the world, life, family, parents, the whole nine yards, but we always get back to reggae music in some form or fashion. Uh, my new music that I have been getting into, I was just telling Scotty today that the artists that we like, they're not really producing CDs and albums anymore because they're not mainstream artists who can get by on one or two CDs and make it into the big time. They have to tour and they have to tour constantly. So they're really not making records because the white music industry, as, as Prince would always say, the music industry is not run by musicians. It's run by lawyers, uh, producers, agents, studio honcho heads. So, just getting back to it, our music is, is what really makes us, what separates us from many, many respects. Is what, is, our music is really the envy of the entire world. And it's just, it's such a part of us. As, as uh, Pro Professor Ra was saying, the, the call in the fields, in the slave fields, the calls to each other under these truly oppressive conditions, the music is what kept us going. The music is how we communicate with, with each other. We had signals in the music. We had meanings in the music that were just beyond the words themselves. So music is sort of like the glue that holds us as a nation and as a people together. My personal take on it. One, one last thing. Uh, Professor Rob was also mentioning African music. One of the hottest music scenes on planet Earth right now is Afro Beats. With the uh, Wiz Kid, the cats out of Nigeria, Ghana, and really London, if you notice a lot of the 
the uh, African artists speak with a pronounced British accent. Just shows you the power of, of the British Empire still reigns, even though they're not thought of as one of the major powers in the world, and they still are. But the but the British Empire was so so. What do you call it? What's the word I'm searching for? Uh, Influential. Uh, they were so they just Impactful. came in. And, just they just came in and took over people. Imperialist. Uh, what is the word I'm looking for? How they came in and just ran countries and then gave them back after they stripped them of all the resources they could get without the people killing them or running them out of town. Not colon colonists. Colonialism. What is it? Yeah. It's just. But you know, all of this. You know, they stole our music. You know, they they took our music. They took our rock and roll and what Little Richard was doing. And then they produced Elvis Presley and made him the greatest musician ever in their minds. Or so, uh, first of all, from a box office standpoint, made him into a movie star. And he just stole from the rich. Mm -hmm. But you know, it's 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 um don't sleep on the Afrobeat music, it's coming into the American scene. And these are all black people. As as I like to remind some of my uh, Puerto Rican and my Hispanic friends, the only difference between you and I is a boat stop. When the uh, transcontinental slave thing was going on in the 1600s and most of the black people in this country landed in Jamestown, South Carolina, only 400,000 of us stayed here in the United States. Over 12 million went to South America. It was all black people. And our music travels with us. Go ahead. Right. Okay, uh, what about uh, Brother Damien? Welcome, man. Welcome. Good to see you. Uh, for me, music, I don't know. I was thinking, I'm like, man, what is mine? I don't necessarily have an attachment to music. Uh, of course, I listened to it uh, growing up. I think that was it, probably growing up with my mom. I listened to whatever she listened to. And that was usually R&B, you know, 102.3. That's what she listened to. So that's what I listened to. Uh, and I was out, out, you know, I didn't know any difference uh, until I moved and got to hang out with young people. And they was like, why are you listening to Anita Baker and the Whispers? And I'm like, that's all I know. But then it became, well, this is, you know, listen, listen to some rap. And that's when I, that's when I really, really got introduced into that scene because I was hanging out with young people. Uh, so then rap became my favorite, of course, uh, but I always had love for like the older, I'm gonna call it old school music, whispers, stuff like that. Uh, and then even the church scene, you know, growing up in church, church music, that was, a, that was probably a bigger part of my life. Uh, and that was always, you know, connected back to, I'm talking old school church music, uh, going up yonder, <laughs> you know, like I knew those. Uh, songs, but you know, so even today it's more uh, music, but it's more uh, Christian music. Favorite rapper, I got DMX, so you know, I'm sorry, Professor Ra. <laughs> he's, he's like my favorite rapper, although he's you know, dirty, grimy, all of that, but there was some <laughs> consciousness in it. <laughs> So, uh, but music, that, that's where my music is now. Uh, music is semi a part of my life. Uh, my wife listens to it more every day. You know, she, she's music, she listens to it, she sings. So whatever she's listening to is what I'm listening to. And it's all types of music though. You know, I'll, I'll listen to, uh, I was thinking about even Working, working in the secular space, like at Target, I, I let to listen to all of it. You know, whatever they were playing is what I was listening to, which and 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 then it caused me to, like, oh, I didn't know about John Mayer. Let me buy a John Mayer album because I didn't hear four songs working at Target. Sounds pretty cool, so I'm gonna buy it. So whatever I heard, which expanded my music, because it just went from 102.3 to black rap. Uh, to now, whatever target was playing, John Mayer, uh, you know, all these different people. So now my music is just like that. I can listen to anything. My my dad listened to country music. 
I'm like, okay, well, this ain't for me, but if I'm with you, that's what we're listening to. And he loved it. He sang with it. It it, it stuck too. So I can listen to country music with him and uh, any type of music I'm pretty much okay with. I uh, like uh, Mr. Roberts of Sand. Uh, the, I don't know too many that listen to the Afro beats, I think, but I know a lot of young people listen to uh, Muscani, we talked about it before, just uh, the Asian music. Oh, yeah, yeah, the uh, mm -hmm. pop. Yeah, that's coming in. Korean, Korean pop music. K-pop. Mm -hmm. K-pop, yeah. So it's like, but I think just hearing about the history of it, I've seen documentaries. I love watching documentaries on, on music and Black music, how it started or how it really began. Uh, but that's what it is for me. Cool, cool. All right, Brother Thomas. It's uh, Summer Lake and family. How y'all doing? Thank you, Salah. Um, I have a, a, a different take. I like, I like music. I was raised in the church. I, I still listen to gospel music on Sundays on 102.3. I love music. I love... Uh, different types of genres, but I got to admit that, um, that I'm more, you know, there's, there's an irritation that I have around about, about our music, or at least about how, how society looks at kind of like limits black people's success to entertainment or athletics. And then how our children in high school, the two major professions they see, they want to be in is is uh, either an athlete or some type of an entertainer or a rapper dancer and then I I often find myself at, at a at award shows on TV looking at the award shows and and watching the camera cast in the audience and I often find myself looking at sports games and boxing arenas and look at the audience and I see just wealthy Caucasians being entertained by, by black sweat, either black on the court, black sweat on the, on the court, black sweat on the field, black sweat on the stage, black sweat, you know, entertaining. And um, it's, it's like, uh, it irritates me that, that we allow ourselves black success to be limited to entertainment or athletics or some form of entertainment for Caucasian people. And I admire the history of black music, but we don't own it. You know, black success in music is based upon the first Caucasian radio uh, company studio that purchases that artist's gifts. That's the, that's the moniker of success now when it comes to entertainment, music, or athletics. Everybody's looking for that white man to invest in their craft and therefore they base their success on it. And it kind of reminds me when I listen to the historical breakdown that Baba Ra did and how we had such an opportunity back then to, to claim and own and maintain ownership of our music you know, when it meant something back then, you know, um, it was a, it originally started us having messages in it for freedom, to revolt. But when Caucasian people kidnapped it, it took that out. And now it's just lewd entertainment, hypersexual, degrading itself and, and, and family and women and drug use. Um, a lot of our artists that were mentioned were drug users, alcoholics. They were useless to the movement. Their music maybe inspired people to do certain things, but it didn't inspire us to do much because we're here. I'm not, I'm not discounting any of the things we did in the past. It just didn't work. <laughs> it just wasn't good enough, obviously. You know, um, and and I I attribute it to everything that this Caucasian has been able to do to take the power away from something who, that was rooted in revolution. 
to take the power from anything that we did that was rooted in revolution. Remember, the Caucasian's purpose and goal is to pacify, is to, is to pacify us to the point where we're no longer thinking about the movement, useful for the movement, thinking about revolution and freeing ourselves, improving our condition, except when it comes to individual improvement of condition, where we focus on our family, you know, a basketball player gets out of the hood, he feeds everybody in his family, but the community that he left don't get nothing. It's just about his mama, his cousins, his clique, you know, um, so I, I, I really, I love the history of music that we have because I, I listen to it and I find it harder to find relevant music that elicits revolution and elicits the passion and the desire to continue the fight that our ancestors started with the, with the creation of the first musical genre of America which was the, you know, it wasn't gospel. It was, it was what they call uh, on the slave plantations. It was the call and response. It was, um, I forgot what the word, but, it, but, but gospel came out of that though. Gospel came out of that genre. I, I don't know what specific it is, um, but gospel came out of the call and response uh, that, that we did on the slave plantations. Um, so I, I, I have no, I mean, I, I just have no, I'm, I'm kind of tired, tired of us focusing on things that are useless, that, have, that are useless towards us really gaining the freedom, justice, and equality that we deserve as a people united. You know, and I'm tired of us doing everything else but uniting. Um, I was looking in this book that the nation brought out called how white folks got so rich. And it breaks down the millions of dollars that we spend on everything else, but what we need to you know, focus our resources on in terms of freedom, justice, equality, building communities that have the four things that make up a community, hospitals, educational institutions, supermarkets, banks, and other things such as uh, you know, business sector, communication highway and things of that nature. But, but we spend all that money on, and I, and, I, and, I, and I look at these concerts, I hear about these concerts on the radio and Summer Jam this and Summer Jam that. You wear a lot of our people, you know, instead of, you know, instead of doing constructive things, a lot of them are going to these concerts where 80 to 90% of our people smoking weed, popping pills, drinking alcohol, non-constructive behavior that further numbs the brain and the spirit and the body from revolting, from, from furthering the movement of freedom, justice, equality that the original genres of music was created to, to start, to, to move towards. Um, it's a waste of time. We're not using the legacy properly. The first music that was created in this country was to free our, it was, it was to help us endure the worst treatment that any human being ever experienced in the history of humanity. And it also was used as a way to give messages to each other on how to free yourself from the worst treatment that any human being has ever experienced in the history of humanity. And now, it has regressed into, into uh, slut rap, popping pills, black man killing black man, strip club, hypersexuality. Um, if the if it's not perpetuating drug use in the lyrics, the musicians are drug addicts in some way, shape, form, or fashion. And, and, I'm, and when I say drug acts, I include cigarettes. I include weed. I include alcoholic. All of that's drugs that weakens the body, mind, and spirit from effectively being able to fight 
and 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 revolt against the injustices that we have experienced over the past 460 some odd years here. Everything we do in entertainment, we perpetuate the death style culture of our enemy. We drink, we smoke, we, are, we have irresponsible sexual activity that produces single parent households and children that weren't planned. Our music is now a weapon. It's weaponized against us. They even, I even have articles of how, how, how this Caucasian has created certain frequencies to increase fear in the listener, fear frequencies. It's called a phantom 14 Hertz. If you put on an earphone of like beats, you have in one ear, 20 Hertz, and you have the other ear, like uh, 24, I mean, uh, 28 Hertz. And your ears cancel out those Hertz into a phantom 14 Hertz, which is a fear frequency. So now they've been able to scientifically make our music increase the fear that we have of revolting and of standing up against this Caucasian. And I have several articles on that. I could post them. Look, I, you know. Let, 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 me, let me just say this. If, if what you were saying is correct, then there was no Ferguson demonstrations. There was no George Floyd demonstration. There was no Black Lives Matter movement. Let me just say this to you. And I think your theory is yours and you enjoy it, I find. But to say all magicians are a bunch of magicians did not make contributions to the movement. They used their fame. They used their money. They supported movements. I remember in 1962, I heard a song called, Oh, my friends, you can easily tell white men heaven, black men hell. You know what's wrong with that? Louis Farrakhan. Louis Farrakhan plays the violin today. Mm -hmm. And so he, he used music himself. M Malcolm said that, you know, we, he, he enjoyed music. The, the, my point is, is that we, yes, we went through terrible times, but that's why music helped us get through those times, just like religion and spirituality, they go hand in hand. Many of our people came over here, they could not read music. They played by listening to the animals, nature, as Joe Embrick would say. And they learned their rhythms that way. And they made sounds. And many ripples and sound like a bird. I mean, the, there was beautiful things that came out of it from the minstrel shows. Black people was looking for some form of entertainment to take their minds off their suffering. Music was an antidote to some of that. Second, it did contribute to many black people getting money, what LeBron is doing with his money. Many black apps, look, look what um, Dr. Dre is doing in Compton. He's building a whole performing arts. He donated $10 million. Other artists have made contributions. Many of them gave money to the Martin Luther King movement, the civil rights movement, Harry Belafonte, all of them. Sammy Davis Jr., Sidney Poitier, all these artists. And there have been some revolutionary and conscious athletes. Jim Brown tried to deal with the gang problem. There's been a lot of entertainers, and, but we, this is Black Music Month, but we're talking about the appreciation, not, I mean, you're 100% right. White folks stole us, they, they stole our culture, they stole this. But we retained it and did it as much as we can, secretly, privately. We had our own Motown emerge, Stax Records emerge, and there were other black efforts by magicians, 
to uh, proliferate our music in a positive way. Now, the rappers, yeah, some of the rappers, they, they yeah, but when rap first came out, you had KRS or well, R and M, you had Public Enemy, you had even even today, um, um, Kendrick Lamar, they'd be singing conscious lyrics, even Tupac, when he sung about his mama and he sung about the struggle. I mean, they were doing some conscious uh, singing. Now, for, um, uh, for popular music, crossover music, for general population, uh, they, they sung songs of, of some of them. I, you know, I, I just didn't buy that, that type of music that I didn't like. But I still find music I do buy, as, as uh, uh, um, uh, Brother Damien was saying, he said, hey, look, if I hear it and I like it, I'll buy it, you know? And, and so we're looking at what music did to uplift us. Many of our people came out of the gospel movement singing. But in those days, the gospel was used, the first churches was used as organizing instruments uh, for, for black people. They were the first welfare system. They were the first sanctuaries. Uh, so music does play a positive role. Now, have some of our entertainers exploited it, yes. But then again, we do have science. If it wasn't for the sisters in the space shuttle, and never would have got off the ground. It was a brother that created the camera that they used uh, uh, in the first trip to space. And in, 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 in the computer, Apple computer, a brother named John Moon. He was such a jazz fan that Apple built a whole company for him to move him out of Kentucky to the Simi Valley, let him design the building, and he named it after jazz artists. Now you know about the moon that played football sports. Very few of our kids know about Dan Moon, mm -hmm. but that's for us to educate, mm -hmm. to educate the positive attributes. I agree. I can criticize a lot of artists, uh, you know, for not doing what we think they should do. Many of men, white women, many of them going through all kinds of, like you say, uh, dying at an early age from OD and then doing that. Yeah. Well, all groups have that. John Belushi was a young white boy. He died early. Elvis Presley died early over drug overdose. We ain't the only group that had people that became famous that didn't contribute in a, in a way that we knew about uh, uh, to, to the movement. So, you know, we, we, we look at uh, those that late did leave a positive legacy. We look at those um, men around you. We remember the five football room. We remember Central Avenue and, and, and the Dunbar Hotel and the magicians that came through all of that. But like I say, I can understand the frustration many young people have with today's magicians, some of them, but not all of them. And some of them are still around. And most of them, if you ever go to jail, all they play is old school music. And half the rap use old school beats to get their raps off. So we made a contribution to the world when it comes to music. And they emulate us internationally. And they still, they take our beats and they put their lyrics and that culture on it. Western music. It's, it's white music, generally from the West. But they're Black people, Charlie Pride, this other little gay guy that runs around singing on the horse. Uh, they, they, I mean, they, they, they win awards from white folks uh, for singing Western music. This is Black Music Appreciation Month, not deprivation and uh, degradation, but that would have lifted us while we was coming through. Now, brother, uh, I know that you have rhythm. I've seen you with rhythm. 
that rhythm is so and inspirational. And there is some music I know you like. You understand? Even if it's just making love music, put on Luther. <laughs> put on, you know, you know, put on, put on Smokey. You understand? But we merged. Music was a vehicle. Sports was a vehicle. Some of us used it and helped with the movement. Some didn't. Some financed. There was a guy in Nigeria named Fila. I think that was his name. Fila Kuti. Yeah, he was one of the greatest magicians in the world. In the world, they loved him. Uh, man, uh, we 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 have a lot of, of things that we need to look at from a global perspective. You know, and, and I agree with you, Sony, Gerald, all these uh, mega companies have taken and made people rich. We teach this. The oppressor can't be our teacher. Academy Awards, Grammy Awards, and white people giving white people awards. They say this is the number one artist. And you never heard of them, never heard their music. I mean, you know, they can't tell me what's number one. Number one to me is the temptation. The dramatic. <laughs> you understand? I don't know nothing about no white music. I don't ever listen to it. You understand? I, 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 you know, I listen to black people music that I grew up on. But I respect black people that do listen to it. You know, if that's what they want to do, that gets them all fine. <laughs> you know, but anyway, we <laughs> don't go to Joe. Joe, we talking about black music, man. Brother Hendrick. <laughs> Are you there? I'm here. Did you have any comment on Black History Month? Black Music Month. Music. Uh, well, you know, jazz is the one for me. That's the only original African American music, in my opinion. But music in general, and <laughs> instrument music in particular, I think is essential to early child development along with mathematics. I kept my kid in music. You know, my daughter grew up playing the piano, the violin and the flute. Uh, so it kind of helps out with the, you know, with math to a large degree. And, and uh, for my own personal, jazz is the one for me because I don't like no words, nobody telling me what to do and what to think. I just like to listen to the instrumentals part of it. But, you know, people can like what they want to like. Uh, as far as the, you know, the, you know, doing the movement, the ones who I like in particular was like Curtis Mayfield. He always had a message with his music, which I like. You know, we people who are darker than blue and all of that. And James Brown every now and then, you know, especially he said loud and black and proud. <clears throat> But as far as all the others, you know, it's kind of like, you know, use it to get you some game, you know, to get you a woman. And, you know, I got my heart broke and all that kind of stuff. But uh, as far as early child development, I think music, you know, kids playing instruments. I think swimming is essential to early child development. And another one that we've kind of not put as much emphasis on, which I think is self-defense, which we need as a people, period, because until we can do that, we ain't going nowhere with nothing because we can't defend what we can create and develop. So that's all I have to say on the subject. Okay, good. All right. <laughs> so, let, me, let, me, let me end with this, and I hope I had some kind of influence on a, on a Kendrick Lamar, you know, he was one of my students at Centennial. But yeah. even his stuff, I don't understand. And I love <laughs> that gay beats, but I don't understand what the hell they saying. But I love <laughs> you know, so that's it. All right. It's the vibe. Who, who, who shot the sheriff was easy to understand. <laughs> Machinda. 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 My love. <laughs> Yo, what's up? We're talking about this Black History 
music appreciation that was yeah, pushed by that. I got it. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, I mimic a lot of what's been said, you know, you know, uh one of the brothers that mentioned, you know, with my parents, my mama, what you know, my daddy, whoever, whatever they were listening to. You know, that's what I was listening to. And then of course, you guys know the, all the old artists. And you know, one thing I got out of music <laughs> just over the years, I don't listen to a lot of music now. Um, I, I appreciate music though. Um, but it's more or less I use a lot of time when I'm driving with the radio off doing a lot of thinking things like that. But I'm I'm still up on certain music, but Rasa T, you know, he kind of influenced my reggae. Uh, understanding, you know, he <laughs> you know, took that upon himself to to endure that, and uh, it's you know, and, and like I was hearing uh, a lot of positive messages out of reggae music. It's a synergistic type of effect, universal, worldwide, you know, and that's you know, spiritual, and um, you know, so that's what I get out of music. Um, but looking, you know, and and fast sporting going through the times of different genres and things like that you know hip-hop you know i was of age when that was you know popular and enjoyed a few like you know the public enemies you know the conscious artists ice cube um care as one public enemy uh we and we can name more and more but at the end of the day a lot of them were revolutionaries you know krs1 was my favorite of course I think I might have played one of the songs on the podcast before just blasting it out. But, you know, it's it's kind of a lot of things we talk about on the podcast over, you know, every Wednesday and Mondays. Um, these guys have been talking about for years as well. They, I mean, they talked about it in their songs. And so, like I said, I, I, I believe there's there's good and evil. There's positive, there's negative. And uh, music is, is, is not only a tool, but a universal uh, like I said, it has a synergistic effect that, that can calm the masses of people. You know, Marvin Gaye, you know, what's going on and war, what is it good for? And those type of songs, you know, that's what I grew up with. I saw war in Louisville, Kentucky about eight years ago. I was walking around Louisville, Kentucky with some students on a competition and I heard them playing music. It's also a live band. It was Juneteenth, matter of fact. And, uh, you know, it was that time, it was during that time, you know, and they were celebrating, it was, a, it was downtown Louisville. And, uh, and these young folks that I was with, I was older, I said, they don't know anything about this. I said, I made them all come down. And we were listening to the music. It was actually war on stage, you know, like I think the lead singer was still with them and one other guy, original member. And uh, like I said, this was about, I think about eight years ago, maybe something like that. And uh, I tell you what, um, it still had that same effect on me in terms of just, you know, it's kind of like I went into sync with it to where it's giving out a positive message and I, I linked up with it, you know, and it, it's, it uh, reminded me of how to be and what not to do and how to help and how to love and, you know, those kind of things, you know, and so, you know, that's what I appreciate about the music is because it puts things in perspective, you know. And of course, you know, we in a, it's like somebody said, I think Dr. Ra was talking about music is global and music, music can have a, 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 a world effect, you know, on people in negative or positive. But, you know, but I, I like to think that I rock with the positive side of things and, and I seek out positive now, all that holes and bit, bit, this and this and that. No, I don't subscribe to that, but I do know that now behind it, some of the beats and things like that, that they sampled from some of the elders, you know, and mm -hmm. they use that, still use that music. They still use that music um, because it has, you're, not, you're listening to the lyrics, like Brother Hendrick said, I don't know what the hell they saying, but if you know, if you listen to some of them beats sometimes, you know, it'll be like, man, that still got that, you know, it, it, you, you can kind of do your little two-step on it and don't even know what they're saying because it, 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 it's <laughs> A spiritual connection there and, but you know like you say if not if you want to get like brother thomas say you know if, if we take it to the point to where we're you know allowing it to manifest in our psyches you know drugs and alcohol and calling you know disrespecting the race and disrespecting each other and all of that and it's prevalent and that's what i get out of his message i think 
think that's what he was trying to put across. He, you know, I believe, you know, I don't speak for him, but that's what I got out of that. You know, it's like, hey, you know, we know there's goodness out there, but this, that, but, but the enemy is really using music as a weapon because it has a universal global effect and it reaches people exponentially. You know, so that's also being mindful of that. You know, and so anyway, I enjoyed all everybody's brother Ronnie. You know, everybody. Uh, Conversation, brother Damien and Brock and uh, Rossiki, y'all. Thank you. Have a good night. All right, all right. Well, I'm, I'm just gonna say, you know, music is, is it helps people escape from a lot of their issues. Mm -hmm. It helps them get through the day. It helps them. Some people, that's how they work. They work listening to music. Music has a, a, a psychological and spiritual effect on people. Different people have different tastes mm -hmm. and different uh, appreciation. Uh, when we start talking about black music, we're talking about music that uplift black people. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about black people that sing. It's because a black person say it don't make it black music. Because mm -hmm. a black person rap it don't make it. That's why I said Charlie Pride. He's some white folk music. Uh, there's a lot of black people that sing opera. You understand? But black music come out the black experience. So when you say, uh, you know, uh, uh, acapella, uh, working on the chain gang, you know, uh, you know, help people get through that oppression that they're going through. Um, the escorts made a beautiful album while they were in prison. You understand? They practice music and put on talent shows. They help the prisoners deal with the, 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 the thing. It's an escape for some people. Hmm. But at the same time, that's why we appreciate the role that it has positively. In order to understand what's good, you got to have some bad. Or you wouldn't know what good is. And in order to have not contributory talent and art, you have to have non-contributory. We can criticize everybody that ain't doing nothing, but we have to praise those that are doing something and, oh. and, and, and recognize them for, for, their, for that. Oh, so so can, I, can I say this, Professor Rock? Yeah. Um, you know, with the type of society we live in, it's, it's based off of negativity and it thrives off of negativity. So what's gonna be presented and what's gonna be popular is the types of music and genres or just the types of music is it's gonna thrive. It's gonna be the negative music that's, that's popularized and put out in front of us. And mm -hmm. that's what they use as a tool as it was mentioned by many people here. So that's, that's uh, what you're gonna get. But I know if you, is a, a seeker of of good music and meaningful music it's out there because like brother ronnie was saying and brother brother machinda was saying i'm an avid reggae listener and i'm always finding excellent content and excellent beats because i'm i'm into bass and drums so i i just wanted to share something uh with everybody if you haven't already seen it on YouTube, we had a few shows about, uh, related to music and uh, the whisper experience with one of my cousins, they came on the show and they, they are excellent. They, they sound very close to the whispers and they're, they're sharing the whisper music with, with people, you know, and, and expanding that that uh, information about the Whispers, because the Whispers is an excellent group. And then we had, just on Monday, just on Monday, we had this show here with, with Professor Ra and uh, Agent Shahid. And he was highlighting his cousin, which did major works with popular artists from the 40s, 50s, and 60s. And 70s, matter of fact. So, you know, we we do have some some people out there 
that made great contributions to the music profession. And so, hey, I'm, I, I, I love good music and, um, and, it, and it's, it serves as an inspiration to me to keep doing the things that I'm doing. I, 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 I use it as a positive vehicle and I share some of the music with the student when I'm in class. So I'm very, uh, you know, appreciative of, of art, especially Bob Marley. You know, uh, Brother Ronnie mentioned uh, Midnight, excellent roots reggae band. Uh, they're dis dismantled now, but just like Bob is gone, but his music lives. All right, Professor Ra. Yeah, I wonder, uh, uh, Ronnie, you had to, uh, uh, did you have an uh, issue, Ronnie, you wanted to discuss? Ryan Roberts? Oh. <clears throat> Um, what in particular? I mean, are we, we talking about something? Yeah, we. I had mentioned uh, Rob, what you was talking about earlier with the the, the Senate race in Georgia, with a uh, Warnock and Herschel Walker. Oh yeah, I was just this. Um, you know, I'm a we all a black men who support black people. I'm going to always support black people. I'm going to always favor black people because I'm a black man. But there's Herschel Walker, who a man who is barely literate, won't even go to his own Republican Party debates because he doesn't have anything to say and he doesn't want to be exposed. And he's in locked with 46% he and Raphael Warnock, the minister who won the race that essentially gave the Democrats at least a 50-50 voice in the Senate. I don't understand. It just outrages me as, a, as an intelligent, conscious Black man that how transparent it is to promote someone to bring in someone like Herschel Walker, who wasn't even living in Georgia, by the way, <laughs> to run for the Senate office, a black man who's barely literate, whose resume is filled with lies, who has nothing to offer to the body, body politic except he's got his nose up Trump's ass. That is just <laughs> that is just so disgusting to me. We've always had black men like this, and we will continue to have black men. It's one of our greatest deficiencies is that we just can't seem to unite. The Black experience is a multivariate, multifaceted experience. Every last one of us on this damn screen has white blood running through our veins because of what happened to our ancestors. And we some crazy people, but the beautiful, most beautiful people on planet Earth. But to see a coon like Herschel Walker, just a heartbeat away from the United States Senate tells me that there's really something wrong in the United States of America. Mm -hmm. Really something wrong. There's no way I could ever support. And he's got less than 3% support among Black people in Georgia. Mm -hmm. I just don't understand it I, I, for the life of me. I know that they're going to always boost and put people like him up front to say, OK, here's our house nigger. Excuse my French. I don't have any problem saying that. Here's our house nigga. And that's what Herschel Walker is. A pawn to be used in a big game to, to really disenfranchise and to really push back and to hold down black people. It's the worst kind of human being on the planet to me. Mm -hmm. I, I'm gonna let that go. Anybody else have a comment on the on the Georgia race with Warnock and uh uh, Herschel Walker. What, 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 let, me, let me just chime in for a minute. Throughout our history, we've always had collaborators in our oppression on the continent and all over the world Absolutely. for different reasons. From the standpoint of politics, there's no ethics and morals in your American politics. That's the one game where they hope something bad happened to the opponent. 
You know what I'm saying? I mean, everything else, you know, it's, you know, it's, it, it's different. There's no ethic, no value. Mm -hmm. Class Tomlins, people from Compton, the NAACP from Compton, went and testified at the Clarence Thomas hearing for him. Oh, I did not know that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I did not know that. The NAACP. I did Emmett not know Hart that. Wow. Uh, 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 this guy now, he's over his, uh, uh, something else. I think I forget his name right now. And not only that, I'm not only even embarrassed, this brother. <laughs> Clarence Thomas had a partner to testify to defend him that he went to school with. Compton College Board of Trustees brought him out here and gave him money to speak. Wow. And one of your prominent black historians that was on the board voted for it. But let me just say this. Man. I mean, nothing. I mean why, we talk about the division among us, mostly ideology and ethics and that. It do not compare with the civil war that white folks fought against each other. No. It sure don't not. compare with January 6th when they attacked their own capital. See, Everybody think white folks unified. The reason they are unified, they got police and army. They can punish their people for not doing what they're supposed to do. Herschel ain't the only one got this nose up Trump man. Half the people running, white people running for office got they nose, foot, lips, everything. They, they freaking that boy off. Mm, you, know? Yeah. you know? That's I mean, real talk. <laughs> you know, so. I mean, you know what I'm saying? We don't know how much money uh, Trump, Trump didn't raise so much money. We don't know how much he didn't slid Herschel. But we know he been he had a love for white folks. His, his first marriage was with a white woman that he said he met in a in a jacuzzi. That's where he met his first wife in the jacuzzi. And and so, I mean. The same thing with um, Eldridge Cleaver. His book, Soul on Ice, was about a white woman. He dedicated that book to a white woman. <laughs> when Yui came back over here, he up in a penthouse with Jane Fonda. You're gonna have these contradictions. You understand? They're, they're, always, they're always gonna be there. But you write to criticize and educate young people so that we can try to minimize collaboration with the enemy in our own oppression. But there was there, 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 this brother that was running against Maxine Waters. Trump paid another brother just recently to run for Congress in Georgia, I think, and he switched to be a, a Republican you understand? Most black people that make big money are Republican. In the 1968 election, Sammy Davis Jr., Jim Brown, Will Chamberlain, and a couple of others all supported Nixon. James Brown. Yeah, they supported Nixon. Are you going to look at the history? But that politics, I mean, that's your American government. We have to choose our own leaders by the work that they do and their contribution. That's why we love Malcolm so much. You understand? Because he was disciplined and he was committed <coughs> and he was serious about his religion and about his social justice struggle for black people. And so, yeah, you're gonna have a bunch of Herschel Walker. The number of black basketball players, Cornbread Maxwell, I asked him, why were you a Republican? He said, 250, at that time, he was a pro basketball player. He said, $250,000 uh, 
250,000 reasons why I, I support Nixon. I mean, I'm a Republican. Charles Barkley, Republican. He was going to run for a Republican office in Phoenix. Then this boy, Johnson, that went to Sacramento, he, he ran as a Republican. Now, the first Republicans were radical back in the 1700s, 1800s. It was the Democrats that were racist. Lincoln was a Republican. Frederick Douglass was a Republican. Most Black people were Republicans up to the 30s. But, you know, we don't, you know, we don't know that. But right now, if we're going to build unity, unify with those that y'all agree on that y'all have a common cause for. The Negro that's out there, boy, you be wasting a lot of time spending time with them because we don't have the money to buy them and we don't have the instrument to punish them. Hmm. Uh, the way we were. White folks used to hang black men for looking at a white girl. We can't do nothing to black men and black women. Look at the, uh, the Williams sisters straight out of Compton and then the, you understand, want a baby with long hair, so they go hire. Yeah, I mean, it just don't even make no sense. But the point is, is that's a beautiful thing, man. The struggle is beautiful. I, we still winning despite Herschel Walker. Every day we fight, we win. Every day we have black people like you, brother, uh, Ronnie, and, 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 and the rest of the people on here, we win. We may have different ways of getting there, and how we see things. But we all agree on one thing, that the number one enemy, as Malcolm said, at the Bang Dung Congress, the same man that oppressing you, Rasha Key, Damien, Joe, and Macinda, is this one guy, white America institutions and white people, period. You understand? And as far as working, 90% of black people work for white people. 95% of black people are educated by white people. You understand? I mean, that's just real. You know, I got a nephew, got a Rhodes Scholar. He don't even know who Cecil Rhodes is. That name Rhodesia, that killed millions of black people. Now, most Jews wouldn't take a Hitler scholarship, but we've had a number of black people that have accepted the Rhodes scholarship. But if you got the Rhodes scholarship, you got a bunch of other ones. But you want to go to Europe and Oxford to learn? Hey, our black schools are just as good. You know. So anyway, that's just a little bit. Anybody else have a comment? Y'all live quiet tonight. I guess I got a question. Uh, because like for me, I think what you said, I don't, uh, I tell people that I don't engage in politics, right? So year, years ago, uh, like, let's just say for me, you know, my mom calls me every election. Are you going to vote? Did you vote? You better vote. You know, she she took me to vote when I was of age. I didn't know anything about politics. And I remember I asked her, what do I vote? Because I'm not at, at the time, I'm not paying attention to politics. I'm, you know, she said you vote Democrat. So I went, me and my friend, and we voted Democrat. And I voted probably uh like that for years without ever really watching a debate. And but then like what you said uh, tonight, years ago, uh, that was like I'm I'm a believer, so Christian. <laughs> uh, but like in that sense, I felt like God told me stay out of politics because politics, no values, no ethics. So what's the point of you, sort of engaging in it when, like you said, it's just. They're, they're both sides want somebody to lose at all costs. So like for me, 
I, I clear, I stay clear of politics, but I focus on government agency stuff. You know what I mean? If that makes sense to you. It may, I know what I'm saying in here, but I, I, but it was like, like you said, like, how do you, this is all black men. Like, how do you tell young people, do you tell young people how to vote? Like, let's say, you know, a young person comes to you and say, hey, I actually like the other side for those reasons. Like, I agree with this. I agree with that. I agree with this. This is my person. How do you deal with that? Because I think as a young person, I think I see a lot of people in the 40s and 30s, maybe even 20s who are up in the air about their political views and which side they really want to be on. And I think, like you said, the Trump stuff sort of said, okay, well, if you're on that side, this is what you are. But I think in years, I'm wondering if in years to come, once the Republican party try to clean it, clean up their image, I think a lot of our young people, black, Brown will, because of their values and their ethics, will lean towards the right quietly, but I hear it in their conversations. And, and so it's like, my question is like, how do you, is that okay for them? Well, they, what, what do you think? There's nothing wrong with being an independent. Yes, and you vote, and you vote your interest. Yeah, oh, it, whenever you vote, you vote your interest. If Democrats are against your interest, you vote against them. If uh, right, uh, whites, it, you vote against them. If all of them are against your interest, you just pick <laughs> and choose. And there's no such thing as lesser of the evil. But the point is that you do vote because even if you don't participate, it affects you. Mm -hmm. Who is the president affects you. Mm -hmm. Who is your senator affects you. Yeah. Who's mm -hmm. on the school board affects you and your children and your family. Yeah. So uh, this is a, a system that they distribute life-giving, life-saving uh, 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 material mm -hmm. and discussions. Yeah. Uh, if you got student loans, then you know you're gonna support somebody to say, "Hey, wipe them out." <laughs> yeah. You know. But even no matter what side they're on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But at the same time, if they just for that, but mm -hmm. they also say, you know, I want to get rid of student loans because so many white folks got it. Yeah. But I still believe that black people shouldn't get reparations. And yeah. black people um, uh, uh, are, are the cause of all the problems in America. Then you have to decide. Is voting for yeah. the person with the loans with all this other baggage they wear. And that's why you be, as, 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 as Ronnie would say, Ronnie Roberts would say, educate yourself. Yeah. Um, we've been trying to build a black political party. Mm -hmm. But just be independent. Because uh, Malcolm X said this. And he said, the Republican Party is war. Uh -huh. The Democrats are fox. <laughs> both are canine, and both belong to the dog family. <laughs> and that's a very important perspective. Yeah. And he also said, I'm not a Republican, uh -huh. I'm not a Democrat, and I'm not an American. And got <laughs> sense enough to know it. <laughs> and that's when he came out with that saying. Yeah. Just because a cat climb up in the oven and have kittens. Don't make the kittens biscuits. <laughs> Just because you're born in America, don't make you American. Mm -hmm. Or you wouldn't have the death rate, incarceration rate, a male health rate that you have. Yeah. See? And so that, that's why you fight. Because, you know, you give deference to the Native Americans mm -hmm. because you know that this was his land. Yeah. And you know how the European took it. Mm -hmm. You understand? The same way he took us from the continent. So, you know, we, we you, you have to, you have to. So if the country was built on a lot, talking about we try to make it a more perfect union. Mm -hmm. Well, 
You have to be perfect before you can make it for a purpose. Mm-hmm. It ain't it ain't perfect. Yeah. It never has been. And so uh, you 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 understand that. Oh yeah. Right? You look like you got something to say. <laughs> what about you, uh Brother Tommy? Yeah. Tommy. Yes, um I just have a que- I have like question slash comment about like okay, we from the from the research that I've done. I understand the, the political process that that a president or any politician that we elect, they are loyal to their constituents mm-hmm. because their constituents paid money to get them in the office. Mm-hmm. Their constituents, upon paying money to get them in the office, made certain demands that the politician, whether president, whether Senate, whatever, has to submit to upon accepting that money. Black people are the only ones that don't pay politicians. We don't, we're the only ones that don't purchase politicians' loyalty in mass. See, other cultures, other groups, they purchase politicians in mass, you know, like, like wealthy Caucasian people who have, uh, let's say, average citizens working for them they pay for their politicians to do certain things that benefit them as wealthy and bene- bene- benefits their business too, which means all the white people that work for their business. Black people in mass, like what Baba Ra was saying, you know, uh, about having our own party. If we were to have our own party, that means we'd raise our own money to purchase the politician. <laughs> To make to to fulfill the demands that we bought that we're ban- that we're paying for. That's the way. No matter who gets into the presidency, that's how we get our needs met. We purchase them. You know, it's like it wouldn't matter if you were. A Democrat. Let me just tell you that. Let me just tell you. Right I, I just want to. I, 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 let me just I show you something because you you said something that's very important. First of all. They pay politicians in different forms of, of, of you know, uh, Brother Muhammad. Biden is saying right now, I owe my soul to black people because I wouldn't be in office. The Democratic Party wouldn't have the majority if the majority of black people didn't vote. And they're doing some of the things in our interest. Uh, so yeah, you're talking about them that are paying big money unions and, and white organizations that, that like like Trump, they give Trump billions and millions of dollars. You're right about that. I agree with you. We pay them, but in different forms. You never saw as many black people turn out in 2020 that you did throughout. Young people, parents were taking their kids, registering them in Georgia and in other, in North Carolina, South Carolina. And black people won the presidency. Black people won the Senate. And black people helped the Democrats get the majority. Now, do they do some things for us? Yes. Do they make some major appointments? You wouldn't have that black woman on the Supreme Court if it wasn't for black people that paid the price to get Biden in office. I mean, I, I mean, you know, nah. she's a she's a she's a she's a a, a black female Clarence Thomas, bro. She, 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 I don't with that. Thompson, bro. she no different than Clarence Thomas. I'm not buying that. Come on now. She she I'm not buying that. She ain't no she be like Clarence Thomas. I'm I'm not not watch. Just watch. She ain't on I ain't buying that. Watch. Yeah. Just watch. That's all okay. I have to say is just wait and see. Cause she fits the she she has all of the qualities and characteristics her when she go home she lay next to the enemy she's loyal to the enemy she's a female married to a a white male patriarch which means he is the head of that household not her you know what i'm saying Mm -hmm. you know no come on we we gotta we gotta be the head of the household we gotta stop being we gotta stop allowing symbols you know, brother, brother Muhammad, I, I object. There's a difference between the white man and the man. All white men are not equal. Real, 
-hmm. the real issue and the real reality of it. No woman that they put in any type of power has a black husband that influences and makes sure that she stays on that black tip. Kamala, Kamala Harris don't have one. And this female don't have one. And it's not a coincidence. And Clarence Thomas don't have a black wife. So, so Frederick Douglass married white women. So blatant. We got to stop that. We, 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 we ain't making, it's not working. We're not making any changes by thinking a symbol is substantive. What? It's not, know? it's a symbol. I turned out by thank you. So, so let, let me just let me just let me just finish what I was saying because because I'm like like these symbols are ridiculous. She's sleeping with a devil. Period. So so look, it takes money to purchase politicians. If you put three million dollars in Trump's hand and say these are the five things that you will do in your presidency. Just like you putting $2,000 in the best restaurant on Fifth Avenue in downtown, whatever you order, you will get. No matter where the restaurant is, no matter if you're the only black person in that restaurant, money talks and bull crap takes the bus, period, period. That's how white folks do it. Black people spend over $4 trillion every year. We can raise, we can raise freaking six million dollars and be like look let's wait until the primaries are over and the last two presidents are are about to be elected because it does not matter what party you're in you can still elect on any president you can, you can't elect on a primary if you're independent but you can elect the, you can you can elect the last two so we wait until those last two trump and hillary and we'd be like look let's go tell hillary to come here we got two million dollars for hillary this is what we want you to talk about. And let's invite Trump. We got $2 million for you, Trump. Now, whoever wins, you got $3 million more million to come to, to, to secure our five or 10 demands that you spoke on for that $2 million we paid you for. And guess what they're going to do? Because we're going to use all the media outlets and let them know that we paid, we, we donated $6 million for, the, for, for, for whatever president they want. And guess what they're going to do? They're going to do exactly what we tell them to do because we purchased it for $6 million. That's the cure. This bullshit we're doing right now, it ain't working. It never worked. This spontaneous charity stuff our, our, our freaking entertainers and athletes did back in the day didn't work because it wasn't unified. It wasn't unified. You putting money over here, giving Martin Luther King money over here while some people giving this leader over there, that just stuff don't work. Because if it did, we wouldn't be here. We got to unify our black dollars. If our real entertainers and athletes are really worth a damn, they would take a few of their millions, put it together in a cache, and actually purchase a, a few communities to build businesses, infrastructure, homes, to house, clothe, and shelter their own people throughout America. They would, we, we have billions of dollars. We have billionaires of black people and they ain't unified putting their money there. They're occasionally putting money in charities here and there. That's th that stupid charity stuff that LeBron James did ain't worth a damn. He didn't make no private school. He did a public school. He's a part of the public school is a part of the problem. I'm a teacher. Public school is a part of the problem. Why our children are going to Caesar's school and coming out Romans. That's the problem. They, they ain't black schools. They go into Caesar's school and come in our Roman. Then they go to the, then they take like what, what Ross said, they go to some PWI, which is a major Caesar school, and coming out, sell out Romans. Ain't even looking at the black community, ain't looking at black men and women to be married to, ain't looking at black communities to beautify and reinvest in, because they coming out looking to go move in some other community, purchase homes in some other community, spend all their resources in some other community, and neglect the community that birthed them and built them up and made them the athlete or entertainer that they are. This stuff ain't working, man. Punk that sister, that racist ass Biden put up in there to silence us about the Black Lives move Movement and all the atrocities that we've been dealing with. He pacified us with her. He said, look, they about to have a movement because we killing these black folks with George Floyd and all these other people. Let me pacify them with this, with this 
this uh, Caucasian sister in blackface married to a Caucasian man. Let me pacify him, them real quick and make him think that I'm actually giving them something when I ain't giving them nothing. I'm giving them a damn woman that's sleeping with the enemy. Pump that, man. You're saying that he didn't tell Claiborne that if he got in office, he would go and point a black woman. Right. Black folks been getting killed all year. I, I didn't ask you that. Chinese people question. get their ass whooped no, for a week. No, no, he, made, no, you, makes a law, made, he makes a law. He makes a law. You made them. Don't make no laws for us. You Brother Thomas. Comment. Brother you Thomas, let, let, let Ross speak, please. You made a comment. You said that Biden appointed her to pacify her. But he had made that commitment to appoint a black woman before he got in office. He told Claiborne that. And that was one of the motivating things for, that Claiborne used to get black people out to vote. Now you ain't gonna get everything you want. And I agree, some politicians do respond to money. They respond to the National Rifle Association. They call lobbyists. And we do have black lobbyists that work for major corporations and, and unions and, and things of this nature. I mean, that's why they had to sit down with A. Philip Randolph and the Porters and the Porters. We've had these things that you're saying we need. We have black towns and black businesses. You understand? But they burned it down. But we rebuild again. We're resilient. We're in war. You may not know it. And you may not be at war, but your people are in a war. A lot of your passion, I can I can understand, you know, you locked into your passion and your view, and that's good. But I see positiveness in many black people and black organizations and black people with money. This brother that paid all them loans off as Spellman. When they at their graduation, I forget his name. He paid all the student loans off. That's positiveness. To say um, uh, uh, Jalen Rose has the Jalen Rose Institute, and 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 LeBron James School was for it got a waiting list, and it was for at risk kids in Cleveland. Even if it is a charter school. All private schools, all education, come up under the State Department of Education. You open up a school, they got to approve it. I mean, I mean, you can open it up. I mean, all of them come under the state. That's why you have a State Department of Education. A black man in California is the superintendent right now, running for office again. I think he made it because he got over 50% of the vote. We had black people that was uh, 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 superintendents before. You know, I understand your position that, you know, none of this has worked, but you're doing pretty good in comparison to 1820. You understand? <laughs> I mean, uh, you're, we all standing on the struggle of those that even if it's an inch of progress, we all standing on their shoulders. We're not in shackles physically. Some of us are still in shackles mentally. Could we do a lot better? Yeah, if we could, we would. But accept the progress that we are doing. No one has asked for um, more money than our spiritual institution. And they promised to build stuff. From improving their church to uh, we're going to open up businesses and doing that. Some of them did. Some of them didn't. But you can't argue that there ain't been no progress. There had been a lot of progress. When you in your classroom, you you know you teach that subject that they want you to pay you for, but at the end, 
you give them some insight. You give them some, some, some of that sacred knowledge from that burning sand knowledge, from that seven seed. You know, you said, brother, you, 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 know, you, you mentor people. You do rites of passage. I mean, I've I worked through, you know, I, man, you know, I think, you know, I had three tutoring from 1979 to 2004. I said, you don't do no research paper, you come. But most, I couldn't get one teacher to come and volunteer and help on a Saturday. I didn't get mad. I didn't say, well, I ain't going to do it. I ain't talk about the teachers because I don't know if they're married, they're going to be divorced. If they just don't want to do it, that's their right. Do what you can do toward the movement. I'm not looking at nobody else's plate. My daddy taught me that. You know, I said, my brother had more weenies in his beans than me and my daddy with my butt. They just eat what's on your plate. And I remember that. I ain't done quit looking at other people play. I'm not looking at who's not struggling. And I'm not looking at our mistakes. I'm looking at our progress. You know, Chokwe Lamuma's son is mayor of Jackson, Mississippi. They just had a national unity conference. Another national black political conference. People are trying. You know, they're looking, they, they're trying, they're doing the best they can. And so, you know, if you don't stay up with black networks and information, you think we ain't doing nothing. But there are a lot of black people that's doing a lot of positive things that don't get, the unsung heroes. That sister, Lady B, Lady um, Ruby and her daughter, at the at the hearings, uh, the Trump hearings, and the rest, insurrection here, they bold women. You know they, you know I mean I, and I, I, you know, they stood up there and said, "Hey, look, our lives are ruined and changed forever, but we gonna tell the truth, and we did the truth." I said, hey, man, that took a lot of strength. To get on national TV. At first, they just knew your name national. Now they got your picture, your face. But they stood up. I'm looking for the people to stand in the brother. That's it. You know, those that want to sit down, I ain't mad at them. Because it's a long, protracted struggle. We may not see it. The, many of the Black people in shackled slavery didn't see the brothers and sisters that got the chains off of them. And as I told y'all, as I conclude, when Granger, they, they celebrated Juneteenth and nothing Granger rode in on that horse with 2000 troops to let white folks know that they were holding 250,000 or more African people still in slavery uh, against a two-year-old proclamation that Lincoln had wrote two years before Granger wrote in it. And in that document, it told them, you are free. I mean, you got to let them go or pay them. And then he told the Black people, it's in the document. I send it to y'all. It said, Stay on your plantation and work, but they have got to pay you. If you don't have a job, they started the vagrants law. We will put you in jail and then farm you out to somebody for slavery. But people think, they think a white man, white man always want to pretend like he freed us or he helped us. When, when Sid and Bull whooped him, he didn't say Sid and Bull outflank their greatest soldier at the time, Custer. They say Custer last thing. 
<laughs> when, 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 when the Koreans whooped him in Korea, they didn't say the Koreans beat him. They said MacArthur said, we'll be back. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, he always, he always going to flatter himself and put himself in a positive light. Yeah. We have to do that, too. Put ourselves in a positive light. There are young people using drugs and alcohol, but there are young people graduating from college too. You know, you know, that's who I want to talk to. I want to talk to the mama that raised 12 kids. None of them got arrested. And none of them used drugs. Now, what was your formula, mama? Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know, by that's yourself. You know, look yeah. for the successes. You know, we can always find mamas that say, y'all go out, I'll just let, let me watch my soap opera. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's, that's okay. But show me the mama that raised her kid. Father's Day just passed. I want, that Father's Day didn't meet the goals and standards of Father's Day. And we pray for them and hope that they come back around. But what we really want to talk about is the fathers that have a presence in their children's lives, as they feel the presence of their daddy. You understand? I saw your pictures with your daughter graduating, <laughs> Brother Muhammad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you right there, brother, smiling and grinning. Yes, sir. You understand? Yes, sir. So, hey, I understand that. Now, that's what I want to talk about. I don't want to talk about the girl that on <laughs> drugs and chasing a boy. Yes, sir. <laughs> Talk yes, about sir. the positiveness. You got a daughter coming. Yes, sir. You ain't, you ain't, you ain't, you, the last thing you thinking about is her going astray. Yes, sir. That's right. Because you're going to be right there to make sure she don't. Yes, sir. That's right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so that's why I didn't mean to go off this long, but <laughs> nah, Rasha Key, you, tell, tell, tell us what's going on, Rasha Key, uh, for, uh, uh, yeah, let, let's use let's use our passion to drive us. We we doing a very good job showing up. I appreciate all of you guys for coming this evening because we we had an additional two that came on at my request, and, and I appreciate you for doing that. And let's take our passion and and put it towards the strengthening of of what we do. Okay, so next week we got two guests on the show. Alexis Kelly and Charlene Castle. And the topic is homelessness and mental health slash substance use. So I know Alexis is a, is a social worker and the other lady, I, I have the information in my phone, but we will get to know both of them and, and the work that they do. Excellent, excellent show for next week. And we got a Thursday show on the 30th the next day at 11 a.m. because we have a guest that's gonna be in Ghana. There's a seven hour time difference. So I'm gonna be on early in the morning. Well, not early, but you know, at 11 a.m. and hopefully we we'll have people here to, to welcome her. So her name is Victorious, well, pri Priestess Victorious. And the topic is gonna be Khalifa Consulting in Ghana. So this is a young lady that grew up in the States and she moved to Ghana just recently. So that should be interesting. So Professor Ra, we got anything for Monday? I'm gonna try to get Dale Campbell who just wrote the book, uh, Compton Baseball Lab, where he talks about growing up in Compton, playing baseball and all the great uh, athletes uh, in baseball that came out of Compton and the role of Cressy Park, uh, uh, you know, uh, and now it's Gonzalez Park and all the great athletes uh, by way of his biography. So I'm going to get him here. He went to Centennial and uh, he was a coach at Linwood. I think, Joe, you remember a uh, Coach Campbell, Joe? I don't know if Joe's still there. I know him. I know Dale. Yeah. Yeah, well, he just finished his book. We're gonna to try to get him on. And I'll, I'll let you know tomorrow. I'll call him. I'll call him from dialysis. You know, 
and, uh, and lock that down. I want to thank everybody for coming. And Ronnie, keep pushing down there, boy, in the deep south, man. <laughs> you know. I understand, too. <laughs> All right, brother. You're doing All a right. great job. Thank you. You know, and you're working, you, you helping a lot of youngsters. What's that t-shirt say? Uh, black, black, teacher, black teacher magic. All right, bro. That's beautiful. All right. All right. I can't just produce magic. Brother Damien, you're welcome. And if you have a topic that you'd like to discuss, you can do it on my Monday show anytime. And okay. listen in. This is an intellectual center where we share the wealth of knowledge that each person has uh, and their views, no matter, even if it's different from your own. Oh yeah. You understand? So you welcome. You trust me, you welcome. Please. And yes. share and spread the word. I am. I am. All right. Yes, All right, sir. Master. Okay, so uh conscious corner and each one teach one. Everybody have a good evening. All right, please.